Hello and welcome to Autology, the podcast that brings you the latest on automotive technology. Today's episode is called Navigating the Software Highway, and you're here with me, Matthew Beecham, and Aaron Dale, our user experience and connected car expert here at S&P Global Mobility, and Heikel Huttle, Vice President and Software Products Business Lead at Harman Automotive's Intelligent Cockpit Business Unit. Hello to you both and thank you very much for joining Autology. The software defined vehicle is another but new buzz phrase in the car industry, often shortened to STVs. An STV is any vehicle that can improve its capabilities over time using software updates rather than needing physical parts replaced. A vehicle becomes software defined when its technology allows automakers to create, install, or manage software across various models, whether they're older, newer, regardless of whether they're basic or luxury models. But it's not just about updates, it's about bringing fresh value to a car. So how has all this come about and what does it really mean for the automotive industry? Well, in the past decade or so, the industry has gradually shifted towards software-driven design and manufacturing, with software becoming a key differentiator among top players. And the emergence of SDVs not only creates new revenue streams and customer interactions post-purchase, but also transforms the driving experience and expands automakers' offerings. But automakers now face competition from technology firms in the software market, prompting them to invest in software capabilities to form partnerships with suppliers like Harman to maintain competitiveness and meet sales growth. So the first question that I have for you, Aaron, is how do you see the rise of software-defined vehicles with over-the-air updates shaping the future of automotive industry? I'm thinking particularly in terms of the customer experience and vehicle longevity, please. Sure. So, you know, when we, when we look at things, how they, how they stand, we really can see that the, the, the rise of the software defined vehicle, uh, particularly, you know, backed by uh, over the air update uh, capability uh, is really set to, to transform the, the, the overall automotive um, industry across a, a number of, uh, of kind of profound ways. So when we look uh, particularly at, at customer experience, often, you know, when we look at new technologies, we see the consumer having to, to, to gain familiarity around that technology in, in some ways, having to, to catch up with the, the introduction of, of technology. But I think, you know, the key difference this time is we see that consumers are already primed for a change in, in experience uh, from the vehicle. So we almost see you know, software defined vehicles giving rise to, you know, from a consumer perspective, uh, what we'd say is, you know, uh, experience uh, defined um, vehicles. So we see, you know, consumers are, are already uh, used to the, to the ease of getting app, app updates, uh, bug fixes through their, through their mobile uh, devices. And now, you know, they, they expect a similar experience already from their, from their cars. You touched on on OTA over the air updates, and I think that really is a, a key enabler here. So within our own forecasts, we're you know we're tracking uh, over four hundred vehicles to have this uh, capability by by twenty twenty eight. So really, uh, you know, positioning the industry to be able to to, to, to capitalise uh, around developments. And what this enables is 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 consumers can receive new uh, new features, performance t- uh, tweaks, uh, bug fixes. Uh, remotely, and uh, you know this 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 continuous improvement cycle also helps the you know the ve- from the vehicle software standpoint to keep up to date and kind of a- effectively extends that that lifespan as well. I think another you know exciting uh, aspect that that we're tracking. I'm you know uh, more focused around the the, the HMI. Uh, aspects here is is the, the push towards and actually the need for customization. So we see you know through software updates you can you know more easily adjust you know vehicle settings, information, infotainment system settings, add some and enrich new features to to, to the vehicle. And, and I think previously we you know we didn't see this this level of personalization. Uh, I think that will sit well with the with the consumer who has you know a very personal crafted experience currently in the in the digital world and that will you know move through into into the vehicle as well so i think you know we we we're, we're seeing a lot of changes from from the consumer side but importantly you know from from the industry perspective that the move to, to 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 sdv really opens up a number of new revenue streams for for the automaker they can focus more on on selling software updates features and, and create this you know, evolving dynamic relationship with consumers. And actually, you know, we've already seen 
a number of automakers announced stated revenue targets, typically, you know, targeting the year 20, 2030, so slightly longer term forecasts we see from, from, from General Motors, for example, you know, they're stating that the $25 billion uh, revenue just will, will come from the you know, software services and subscription side. Equally, you know, we're seeing Stellantis echo that with 20, 20 billion euro projection by, by that year. So, you know, we are seeing the, the, the recognition of, of, of the trends and, you know, committed uh, timeframes in which, you know, the, the, the industry will, will target to start to, to generate and, uh, and transform that, that, that business model. So yeah, I, see, I think we see you know threefold from the consumer side, from the from the commercial opportunity side for, across OEMs, and then also in terms of efficiency and, and longevity of, of models as well, and the benefits that that, that, that can bring. That's great. That, thanks. That's that's a lot going on there, and thanks thanks very much for the great overview. What are your thoughts there, Heiko? Uh, many thanks for that, and uh, and couldn't agree more. Obviously, so it's. It, Actually, sitting around with, with experts and talking about STV, I think we all come to the same conclusion at that point. But at the end, what what we see at that point is that there is this consumer push because consumers are asking for real-time connected experience and so on, which they are actually used to from either their smartphones or their smart TVs and so on. So this big push is there. And so far in the automotive industry, we were not able to actually follow the pace, what we see in, in the mobile and the smart TV and the home appliances and so on. And truly enabling this is one of the key, let's say, elements which, which led to that we can finally turn the page and not are defining the hardware first and then somebody has to find a way to bring software on this hardware. Also then let's start with the software and the features you need to satisfy your consumer needs at that point. And then we have to be able to bring proper hardware over life cycle to these consumers with the need in software. And this is this is actually why I'm truly excited to work for Harman because uh, not only that, that we are at the very forefront of STV, but since 2015, we also heavily invested in OTA technologies. So we are one of the market leaders and uh, this is clearly one of the great areas to see how it has progressed over the past years that OTA is truly an enabler for STV. It's not the only portion. And we have to work towards improving life cycles, improving software features, because the uncertainty, the window of opportunity to make business is actually narrowing down. If we, the life cycle nowadays of a software feature is two years, then you need to add features to it. And this can only be achieved by OTA capabilities. Because having somebody with his vehicle driving to a workshop and then do a fancy software update for six hours, I think was never acceptable and is no longer acceptable at that point. And you can clearly see that with the OEMs that they understand more and more that they need to have a certain control of their in-vehicle stacks. And they're looking at the whole industry, not only the automotive industry, to help them to enable this. And this is quite a challenge if we compare the trend with the SDV, for example, with something like cloud, because cloud as it stands is nothing more than a software defined data center. And we've seen similar things in the, in the early 2000s with data centers as we see with SDV. And the key point is, can I get more cost effective? Can I be faster to the market with SDV? And then, then we will see huge adaptions of all of this technology to push forward. And this means that they, the OEMs, or let's say the whole industry, can finally fulfill the promise of amazing digital revenues as outlined by you, Aaron. That's great. Thank you very much both for that. So some very interesting thoughts there, Heiko, especially how this is um, not only benefits consumers, but also provides the, um, the automakers with the opportunity to build greater customer loyalty and of course sell more services and features just thinking about uh concerns i mean i just wonder with concerns about vehicle hard hardware and obsolescence due to rapid technology advancements i wonder what strategies do you believe uh, automakers can adopt 
to ensure their vehicles remain relevant and functional amidst this evolving software and connectivity standards while still delivering that all important novel features to the consumers. Aaron, any, any thoughts there? Do you like to go first? Yeah, sure. So I, I think from you know my side, what, what we've been observing already taking place in the, in the market is, we, is we've been seeing you know the evolution of, of of how quick technology is coming to the market. We're seeing these much you know we've seen this show up in, in much faster refresh cycles from, from from the automaker standpoint, and consumers are now becoming accustomed uh, to the speed of, of of transition and no longer now. Uh, an OEM can, can can wait into a new new model refresh to, to be able to, to to bring this technology to, to, to market. So they're they're really challenged to, to 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 keep pace here and deliver in line with 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 consumer expectations. So I think the concerns around hardware is 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 certainly certainly a, a big concern and and validated. I think we're seeing you know a number of different kind of potential um, solutions ar- arise in order to be able to to, to combat this. Um, so I think there's no you know there's no getting around the fact that that the sometimes the the pace of development on the on the software side will you know uh, outpace hardware development in in many instances. Uh, so you know one one approach we're seeing is actually building in that uh, that the hardware components may have to be replaced and we can't you know always always get around that. So one one effective approach is to to to, to look at designing vehicles with a, with with more of a um, hardware system. So so parts like you know infotainment systems, sensors, connectivity module modules can be you know more easily upgrade upgraded and. You know that way we see that when when a new technology or, or kind of standard emerges, the, uh, the, the, the entire platform or entire vehicle doesn't become obsolete. Uh, instead, it can be you know refreshed in a in a strategic way and in a way that you know can be can be brought to to, to the market at a faster uh, pace, keeping keep it keeping costs down as well. We also you know see the importance around industry standards. And, you know, by doing this, automakers are, are really ensuring that their vehicles can accommodate future upgrades uh, and not just, you know, the current functions and features that are, that are, that are available. And, you know, really this helps to, uh, to, 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 to really be compatible in terms of maintaining, maintaining the, the, the evolution of, of technology. We've seen a number of kind of ecosystems and alliances emerge as a good way to kind of future proof this change. You know, one example is the, the, the connected car um, consort that looks across, you know, connectivity protocols and you know, vehicle, vehicle access, for, for an example. And this is, you know, really a, a strategic move and it enables, you know, those alliances to, 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 to collaborate openly and, you know, automakers to to evolve in unison and, and not have, you know, so so much variety within the market. So yeah, I think overall, you know, having a, an element of a, a partnership and working with companies, you know, across the across the ecosystem, but also, you know, thinking ahead and designing in a way that can keep keep current with with trends is is kind of paramount. Sure. It's, it's very interesting that connect, you know, collaboration throughout the industry, particularly in this world, particularly this sector, is always key. And it's interesting you remarked there, Aaron, about the Connected Car Consortium too. Heiko, any any thoughts there around about the, the, the strategies again, what, what the automakers can do and, and what, what are you seeing? Yeah, as I think I quickly touched on that in my last answer, but I truly believe there is a, a huge shift in mindset coming now from a Hardware first thinking, going into a software and cloud first thinking. And everything we have seen in the cloud space, it is, yes, all about collaboration. It's all about bringing things to market jointly where it makes sense to collaborate because it's, it's commodity in a sense of software and technology. One, one of the examples in the cloud space is actually Kubernetes, which is a full open source software. And I think most of the clouds are based on Kubernetes at that point of time. And clearly, um, to to add to, to what Aaron said, the Connected Car Consortium is a great consortium. For example, Harman as well has joined the Eclipse Working Group for STV to really, really be part of these communities building building the things which Linux, for example, has built across 
in the various decades, because when, when I first got introduced to server operating systems, we all talked about Sun, Solaris, IBM, IAX, and so on. Nowadays, we when it comes to servers, we all talk about Linux. And I think a similar shift, I'm not saying that it's all Linux then in the vehicles, so please don't get me wrong at that point, but we will see a similar shift how the industry should collaborate and how we should actually join forces in the open source space because it basically doesn't make sense for example to develop 20 automotive grade container runtimes it makes sense to build one for all of us small fast compute let all the big brains work together in the open source space and push it forward and this is actually also the shift we see in vehicle because we're, we're coming from this all hugely distributed ecus in the vehicle to to sonal architectures and even going beyond that that we're getting fully centralized which basically means that that we have to virtualize that we have to use technology which is common in cloud as of today and this is this is actually where i think the whole way of collaborating in the automotive industry needs to change because the knowledge how to actually bring these technologies into vehicles. This is so distributed across various companies so that no company on its own can succeed in the challenges we have in the future at that point. And this is clearly, this is, this is why I'm so excited about this whole SDV trend, because finally we get the amazing technology from cloud we get this in vehicles, we can bring this to developers and we can enable the developers to do amazing things with vehicles. And this innovation pushing forward is key to my thinking, key to our thinking, key to really, really enabling that cloud to edge world. And it has from our point of view, a huge potential to influence all the interfaces as of today towards something better for us. And if we look back a few years where we all said that next year, actually, we all will be sitting in level five autonomous driving vehicles, who would have thought that this would be <laughs> such a bad, bad perception in our future? But here we are. Few things working, few things not working, and we are learning. And this is I think autonomous driving in the automotive industry is one of the key examples, learning through failure, learning how things can progress through failure. That's a typical tech slash software thing. Because on hardware, if you fail, it's broken. But on software, with, the, the, with capabilities like OTA and telemetry, you can improve on the fly. You can be better by learning what went wrong. And this is the beauty of software. And this is this is why I really love to be in this industry right now, because I think when we look back, when I'm old or even older than now, let's put it in that way, then <laughs> then I will say, okay, I've been part of this, this massive change a few years back. And I think I can look back very proudly and say, I've done what I can to help this industry to move forward. That's great, Arco. Okay, thank you very much. Just there's so many things there, but I think the industry's predictions for autonomous driving haven't quite played out yet. Uh, but plenty of other opportunities have, and it's uh, we can we can feel your passion certainly. I just wonder, just given the automotive landscape there, that that picture that you're painting, how far ahead can OEMs realistically plan for where for for when producing cars today? I, I get again, Aaron. Would you like to go first on that? I think we can we can certainly say that the OEM the, the, the time scale that OEMs can, can can realistically plan has been has been shrinking. So you know we wouldn't go beyond you know realistically kind of five five years ahead. I think that you know that of course there's a there's a need for for, for long term strategic planning. But as we just talked about, you know the the, the autonomy forecast we're seeing how you know both ways in terms of new technologies coming in at a faster rate than expected and you know another technology is perhaps not manifesting as as, as fast as uh, as had been projected in the in the past so we're seeing you know a lot of a lot of variance in 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 that in, in that kind of forecast inside you know we're seeing regulatory changes as as well to, to account for whether that's a, you know general safety regulation whether that's you know things like a ncap program and 
uh, you know, other other bodies that can, you know, really influence the the, the need to, to adjust and to, to rebuild uh, products and introduce new features to, 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 to accommodate. And then, you know, the perhaps the, you know, the one that's, the, that's, that's changing at, a, at the fastest rate is, is consumer perception, consumer interest and willing to, willingness to pay for, for features, particularly when we look at SDV and we look at the, the range of connected services and paid functional updates that are coming as a result. You know, this is still early days in the in the market and it's yet to be seen, you know, which which features are proven popular with, with the consumer, which features are feasible in terms of value for, for the consumer as well. So I think the danger um, OEMs face if they get you know locked into to, to too long term thinking is is you know committing to, to to a plan and losing that agility to to respond to, to market market positions and you know also the, the the changes in consumer sentiment demand and and, and regulation so it's uh, yeah it's a real challenge we we see at the moment and yeah Heiko's in you know a little bit deeper there to be interested to, <laughs> to get his take too <laughs> thank you i can see you nodding away there Heiko. thanks very much aaron what what's your take on it from harmless perspective yeah. Heiko? thank you aaron uh, at the end it's it's rather difficult in these days because there are so many layers and let's say to in the same security as you could five, 10 years ago plan, you can only plan ahead two years. Obviously the whole way, whether it's hardware, software services, the whole way your planning has to change. You have to introduce, whether it's hardware, software, you have to introduce platform strategy to actually be able to switch either to another market or to switch features or to switch from certain types of vehicles to other vehicles and so on. And that's that's kind of challenging in these days for, let's say, not only the OEMs, for the whole industry. What are the options you need to provide long term? And the ongoing, let's say, uncertainty about ICE versus electric vehicles adds another dimension to this overall. I think as drastic as it sounds, the market, whether it's OEMs, tier ones and, and other players in that space, is due for consolidation. We, we've seen this with, with some of the smaller players currently, and I'm not going to mention them at here at that point, with some of the smaller players going bankrupt in the past weeks, but also the, the, some of the larger OEMs struggling how to meet or how to identify market demand with with all of their huge factories they're having. So there there is a consolidation due and all of that planning they the OEMs and also then the tier ones could have done in the in the past years is now actually shrinking to a very narrow window, which makes it really, really difficult. And then <clears throat> And, I, and uh, I've been choking about this in my, my last answer a little bit, but once we see the introduction, let's say the full introduction of level four autonomous driving, this whole thing will change again, because then the amount of vehicles you need in certain markets will drastically go down. And these are all of the markets where all of the new cars are currently sold or the, the cars with the high margin are sold. And then, then we enter another interesting area of, let's say, consolidation and how the market can fulfill consumer demands. And at the end, it all cries for being modular in hardware, being platformized in hardware, being able to leverage software-defined architectures, and more importantly, to have real strategic partnerships with open source, but also with companies who are able to provide you the needed tech to actually react fast. Left, right, immediate reaction, six month cycles, push it out and really be able to leverage the best and the newest technology in these vehicles. That's great, Heike. That, there's a lot in the mix there. Thank you very much for, for, for giving us that. I'd, and one other uh, thing is, I, I wonder what steps should the automotive industry take to accelerate the transition from hardware-defined to software-defined vehicles? Uh, any thoughts there, Anne? 
Yeah, certainly. So I think the you know the direction of travel is 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 pretty clear here, but uh, but he, the, the the complexity behind the development is is is, is ever growing. So I think one of the, the the key challenges is how to you know keep the the, the rising cost of, of so- software development under control, and you know prolong the uh, the, the the life cycle of uh, of hardware. And you know other other functionalities within the within the vehicle. So I think that that's the you know that's the the the, the challenge. And you know Heiko was just just speaking there in in, in terms uh, of you know having uh, some of those partnerships ready to ready to go, and you know, having having you know a well thought out kind of development uh, development plan uh, and kind of working working groups to to accommodate that. So I think that you know again this would come down to. You know, an understanding that you know the knowledge base is is broadly broadly spread, and you know one a company isn't going to gather in house you know expertise that sit across vast swathes of development. So really, that kind of industry again, that industry cooperation, I think, is you know is, is essential. And you know, strategically planning to 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 to, to outsource or, or bring in house to you know keep that that keep that development cycle going, keep the, the keep the costs down as, as as much as possible. I think we've, you know, we've seen a good, you know, a very recent example of this in, you know, from, from VW and, and their, you know, their, their partnership or joint venture with, with, with Rivian to, to try to, to, to share some expertise and, and in-house and reduce the, you know, the, the, the burden of, of kind of development on, 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 a, on a solo basis as well. So, yeah, I agree that you know maybe there's a an era of, of consolidation in the in the market and uh, you know leading to you know potentially you know more efficiencies and and closer kind of working working arrangements. That would be my my, my take. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, Aaron. More, more collaboration and more consolidation. I wonder, uh, Heiko, what, what 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 what's your thoughts on it? Where do you, what do you see as important? What what's what's going on from your perspective on the through the Harman Periscope? Yeah, no no disagreement to what Aaron said. Let me just take That's another right. viewpoint on that. And from from our perspective, there are two very very important actions OEMs need to take, and both of them from our perspective are completely underrated. One is how to enable software developers. The other one is work in and with ecosystems, being truly collaborative. Both are things which the automotive industry is not used to. Let me quickly go on the enabling software developers thingy. Everything we we are seeing is everybody talks about, hey, we need to build our own stack. We need to do this and that and software and so on. And then you suddenly have hire a bunch of software developers and obviously I'm going into a black and white thingy here, then you hire a bunch of software developers and tell them, hey, develop a full infotainment solution. And then they sit there, they have no tools, there there is there are no libraries, they discuss about operating systems and so on. So you need to give them an environment with the tool chains, with CI, CD, which with telemetry, with with deployment capabilities and so on, to help them to build what you expect from them. And this is truly underrated everywhere we've been looking so far. Then the second portion, like outlined before, you don't need to build your own operating system. There is Android, there's Linux, there are others out there you could leverage. You don't need to build your own middleware stacks because I've never been going to a, to a, to a car dealership and said, Oh, I need an open source container runtime on that vehicle. Otherwise, I'm not buying it. And that's that's something where we have to really, really, really focus. What is differentiating in terms of visible to the consumer? And where can we collaborate? Where can we build once and run many? Because these are the things which already have happened on various hardware elements. And on software, we tend to tend to start building it 10, 20, whatever times, and actually are wasting resources on that to keep up with the challenges we have in the industry from other players trying to enter that market. So that's why I truly believe enabling software developers and truly, truly collaborating in ecosystems. These are the two key steps towards really leveraging 
the technology we, we subsumize under SD. Oh, so that's, that's great advice. Thank you very much, Ike. Again, the collaboration and not reinventing the wheel and uh, pulling together. I just wonder, how, how do SDVs impact or how are SDVs impacting the traditional automotive value chain and, and business models, would you say, Aaron? Yeah, so I think this is perhaps you know one of the you know one of the one of the biggest biggest questions here, and you know I think in in terms of uh, the the obvious shift from 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 hardware uh, centric suppliers to to, to to software and uh, tech service providers. I mean, first, you know we're you know we're seeing that ecosystem uh, grow in terms of you know various various stakeholders. So you know it, it, in some ways that's uh, disrupting traditional business models, but also there's there's you know, there's a lot of opportunity within within the new framework here. You know, we're seeing that um, revenue opportunities don't, you know, no longer stop at the, the dealership level. They can be prolonged, you know, whilst that, that car is in, in action and has has a serviceable a serviceable connection. So that really, you know, changes, you know, changes the opportunity and moves it more towards a, a subscription-based offering. And, you know, we're seeing... A number of, you know, we're seeing virtually all major automakers really, you know, pushing towards that kind of subscription based offer. And I think, you know, not only does that grow the, you know, the value per, per vehicle and the time that that's that stretched over, but it also, you know, offers, you know, consumers uh, different ways and, and flexibility in terms of opting in to subscriptions and services and then and then opting out as well. So I think. You know, one of the one of the ways that we really see the the business model changing is through you know that consumer interaction. You know, particularly around the introduction of a big car uh, application stores. Uh, so they will offer you know a way for uh, for OEMs to, to to offer new forms of location based uh, commerce uh, and inter- and for consumers to interact with their their vehicles in a similar way as they would their their, their smartphone. But this really you know enables OEMs to to, 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 to keep track of, of demand um, at a lot faster rate uh, and to understand, you know, the value of, of, of kind of services and, and, you know, really remains kind of light footed in terms of in terms of offering. So I think, yeah, I think we see a number of a number of changes all leading to a view of, of the revenue opportunity spread across a lot uh, longer time frame than, than, than previously. That's great. Thanks very much, Sharon. SDVs are certainly shaking up everything. For your perspective, Heiko, from the, from the, from the Harman's perspective, what what are you seeing in terms of the traditional automotive value chain and, and business models? Yeah, from from our perspective, we see a tremendous shift in the world before software and electric vehicles and so on. We've been having this traditional model out of automotive OEMs, automotive tier ones, tier twos, and so on. And I think everybody was playing their role. Everything was well balanced. Uh, revenue was distributed. Nowadays, with new players or players going up the value chain, like the SOC providers, for example, or the cloud providers, there is actually a huge shift to be seen because the expectation of the OEMs driven by the consumer needs are higher and higher. And they they want to actually control their own destiny, maybe on questionable elements. I don't know. It's just a slight feeling at that point. But this requires the tier ones to tremendously shift into a more productized environment that they can help the OEMs and also bringing together the SOC providers and cloud providers in a joint business. And this, this, let's say, as simple as that sounds, it is a huge cultural shift. Coming from a, here's an RFP we answer, to, all right, here are enablers, here are products which you can leverage where we have a constant life cycle as a company behind it, and we help you with that. And that tremendous shift from doing a business in one way towards a more productized business. We've seen this in other industry like the cloud providers and so on, but applying this to the automotive industry is a huge transformation. And I think clearly Harman is at the very forefront of this at that point with tons of our products, which we are pushing out and there's more to come at that point. 
but clearly it's a huge cultural shift and you really have to work on how to actually get great leaders who help you in this transformation and push it forward and obviously you have to also convince your customers that they are going on this path with you to really really build something amazing again for our consumers at that point thanks thanks very much Heiko. so the, again it's the, there's there's a great summary for you both there and on how, how things are shaping up Another short question, but it's probably a big answer, I suspect, is I wonder what are the implications for SDVs on customer experience and the user interface design in vehicles? Aaron, again, what, what, what's your thoughts from, from an S&P Global Mobility Research standpoint? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think this area is, is, is crucial. I think ultimately to, to, to recognize any of the, the benefits behind, behind SDV and the new functions and features that are, that are on offer. I think now, you know, the, the, the HMI design becomes more, more important as ever, you know, as that conduit between, between the, the, the functionalities on offer and, and you know, the, the consumer that's requesting those, those, those functionalities. So I think that you know the, the 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 focus now should really be on creating those intuitive user friendly um, interfaces in order to be able to, to to kind of simplify that that interaction between the driver and the vehicle's kind of software software features on the on the back end and if that's you know if that's if if that's done right then the the user experience will will, will be able, will be flexible enough to handle those 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 new features and and functions and you know, really, they will be able to 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 create. You know, what we're seeing is more kind of personalization from 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 the consumer, and you know, really make those make those experiences, make those features high value and a kind of rewarding rewarding experience. So, you know, what we see is perhaps the in- introduction of or the con- you know, continued development of of new input methods. So we've seen a rapid introduction of virtual personal assistance and, and voice, even gesture control within the vehicle. So we're likely to see this, you know, in line with this personalization, this, you know, growing multi-modality within the interface and a look to simplify things and, you know, remove some of the complexities from a consumer side. But, you know, again, I think a proper implementation here and a proper focus on, on development around HMI is really key uh, to bring this into the market successfully. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I think again, the, the simplifying is when you think about the complexity of these SDVs, and just that's just making it getting customers on board with it is all, all the more important. Thank you very much. From a harm perspective, though, Heiko, what, what are you seeing as the implications for SDVs on the customer experience? Being, being a little bit German now, I usually I usually separate <laughs> SDV and consumer experience. And I give you the word. Yeah. SDV is a paradigm shift in terms of how we develop software. And this this is not should not serve as an excuse that today's consumer customer experience should not be amazing at that point. So oh. that's why I usually uh, separate that, although they're coupled together, because SDV gives you more opportunity to do a much better consumer experience at that point. But that clearly should not change. The user experience has to be done properly. From our perspective with SDV, it is possible to accelerate even more in the time to business. And then also it gets easier for OEMs to push new features to customers. And this technology is already available today. So there's no excuse to do it in that way. And and clearly, this is one of the most exciting moments at that point to really, really push this technology to the consumers by also maintaining what you said, Aaron, the the personalization context and so on, and clearly helping the OEMs with over-the-air update capabilities and telemetry to really have not only the OEM software developers, but also their partners, the right information in the right place at the right time and with the right level of detail in the context they need it. And that's that's something which which I constantly also repeat in our internal talks, that if we say, and we, we clearly state this, consumer experience automotive, great. We need to be able to understand the context, 
to provide the context to the OEMs of the drivers, of the passengers, that we can share actually the right user experience at the right time with the customers in the vehicles. Otherwise, everything we say won't make sense because an amazing consumer experience starts with the right context. That's great. Thanks, thanks very much, Heike. That's super. Just one final question for you, if I may. What connectivity feature have you come across lately that you particularly like, you particularly think that's really, really useful, that's got legs, that's worth it? Any thoughts? Uh, Heike, what up? you go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. It's actually, it, it, was, it, it was quite a question to think about at that point. Nevertheless, I would say, and that's my recent change of vehicles, I'm not going to mention brands, uh, but I finally have a digital key on my smartphone. So I can I can leave the house. Uh, obviously, my house is all digital. I can leave the house with just my smartphone, no physical keys, no wallets, nothing. And this is actually why well, I'm in a happy state at that point. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I choose digital key at that point. And yes. I don't think I need to mention that we as Harman obviously are happily offering you a digital key experience if you want that as an OEM. Of course. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 rightly so. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And unfortunately, that's all that, all we have time for today. A big thank you to you both for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join Autology. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to all you listeners for tuning in as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode at our autology at spglobal.com email. And you can find out much more at autotechinsight.ihsmarket.com. And don't forget to hit all the, all the subscribe, follow and like buttons and stay on track with the latest autology podcast. And we look forward to you joining us again at the next episode. Bye for now. Bye.